right, everyone. Well, thank you very much for uh, bearing with us on um, getting these technical logistics wor worked out. My name is Philip Liu, and I'm on the board at PNSQC. And we're really delighted to have our special guest speaker today, Jason Arbin. And Jason's going to be talking about testers don't test anymore, which I think is a really interesting subject. Um, and I'm sure it's, it's caused a lot of uh, online debate. And uh, welcome, Jason. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, great to have you. Hope I can get uh, ostracized from the community. <laughs> yeah. So let's let's go on here. I think just a few, just a quick intro to PNSQC. We have been in existence. We, this is our 36th conference this year in October, and we are actually the oldest um, software quality conference. Uh, we have a big range of speakers from folks like Jason who talk about. Uh, using artificial intelligence in testing, as well as uh, last week we had Michael Ma who talked about um, uh, team size within an agile environment. So our range of speakers is uh, pretty wide and we're really happy to have Jason. So Jason, can you go on to the next one here? Just a quick, some quick house rules. We are recording the webinar so you can have access to it later. Um, other than the speakers, uh, you are muted, but you can participate by asking questions in the either the chat panel would be best. And um, we'll try to get your questions answered uh, during the webinar, but if we don't, then they will be put on a blog either by Jason or by in, inside the PNSQ website. Uh, my name is Phil Liu, as I said earlier, and uh, I'm on the board at PNSQC. I'm also the CEO of a testing services company called XBOSoft, but really today is about Jason. So, Jason, why don't um, why don't you introduce yourself? Cool. It's all about me, huh? Yeah, it's all about you. <laughs> <laughs> this is rare. Four kids, four kids, and uh, and doing sales in a company. It doesn't feel like it. it doesn't happen very often. But so I'm I'm uh, I've been a test nerd for my entire life, basically since um, yeah since school. Um, although the only AP class I did not take was computer science. I thought it was ridiculous to program a computer to do things in a for loop over and over again, but then I get stuck doing it the rest of my life. So, uh, so today I'm the, I'm the CEO of test.ai. Um, we're just a company working on, basically if you think about it, our mission is to test the world's apps uh, with automation. The only way to do that is really with, with machine learning and AI. Um, we, Interestingly, we just got an investment from Google's AI firm uh, with an A round just like a month ago. So that's pretty exciting for us, uh, working with the AI team over at Google and such. And we're hiring and we're actually hiring. So if you like testing and machine learning, let me know. Um, and before that, I worked at a company called Utest, which is a crowdsourced testing company, uh, also named Applause.com. And it was pretty fun because we had one of the world's largest test teams, right, at scale. It was kind of like Uber for, for manual software testing. Um, and before that, I used to work at Google and Microsoft and worked on projects like Search and, uh, and the Chrome browser. So I can get into it unless Phil wants to say anything else. It's all about me. Yeah, it's all about you. You go ahead, Jason. All right, cool. All right, so I'm an old fuddy-duddy. I'm an old tester. I'm starting to get, get uh, some gray in my, uh, my beard now. So um, just bear with me. It's worth it. So back when I was a youngster, um, in school, uh, and this all makes sense in a second. But when I was in school, I worked this comp for this project with Lockheed Martin, right? So they did satellite communications for, for the military and civilian stuff, and even like kind of space probes. So what, what happens is in space, when you send a message out into space, there's a lot of noise. There's like solar radiation, there's gamma rays, x-rays, all sorts of stuff out there. So when you send bits out to a satellite, a lot of those bits get lost, right? So this was a cool, fancy way these Reed Solomon encoders that on the receiving end, you could actually reconstruct the message if a bunch of bits were lost, right? It's kind of a cool mathematical trick. Um, the main reason you do that is because if you had to resend the packets, if you just use a checksum and you realized, hey, we missed some bits, um, those round trips take seconds to minutes sometimes, right? So you'd never actually be able to communicate with that satellite without this kind of a technology. So as a senior project, work with Lockheed, we're building an ASIC chip to do this stuff for satellites. And we finished the project, everybody was done, we're headed out for summer vacation. And I realized, like I, I lost some sleep that night because I realized that we'd only tested it with a few messages, right? Like this big fancy thing, you know, quarter, two quarter long project, and it's gonna be going up into satellites. And we'd only tested with a few sample inputs. Um, 
And so it's, I, was, I was freaked out that satellites were going to fall out of the sky, kill people, burn up, um, or if aliens attacked, we wouldn't be able to get the message um, out in time. So, uh, so what I did was I spent you know, a lot of my next, um, first, the first week of my summer, generating a bunch of test data, a bunch of permutations of messages with, with arbitrary errors, and then feeding through, through the simulation over and over and over again. It turns out that it actually worked fine. I didn't find a bug, but I couldn't rest and couldn't sleep until I'd known that I'd beat the crap out of that software, right? Um, but everybody else was cool. That's when I knew that, that I was a tester. So my first project at Microsoft uh, was working on a, um, a set-top box, so running Windows um, on a uh, set-top box. And in terms of quality and testing, if this thing breaks, like the world ends, right? Because it takes a customer service request. You have to come out to the house. We all love this. We've all done this. Um, uh, to reflash or reboot the machine if there's any major problems with it. And that'll cost, you know, $100, $200 per, um, uh, per visit. So quality had to really be high on this thing, especially in the boot process. Because in all cases, as long as you can reboot and recover, you're, you're good, right? Like at least life would go on. You don't have to have a service call. So what I did, the first thing, and of course, again, I wasn't asked to do this. They just said, you're a tester. Here's this box. Figure it out, right? So what did I do? I started testing it. I, I rigged it up. First thing I did was rig it up so that it would auto-reboot. Um, and then when it woke up and it was good and the, the system check was okay, it would signal itself to reboot in an infinite loop, right? So I would do this on the, on the builds. And the first time I ran it, I woke came in the next morning and you know what happened, right? It, it locked up. There was, um, um, you know, an error booting and it was unrecoverable, meaning rebooting, whatever, you know, soft reboot, cold reboot, nothing would recover the machine. Uh, and so, you know, we had to fix it and reflash the machine and then fix the bug. But that's testing, right? Again, we'll get back to what testing is. Um, so another one, so I worked on IE4. Um, so Internet Explorer 4, if anybody remembers that thing. And I had to test the HTML4 APIs and, the, and especially the cookie API to save cookies for websites, which now gets you in trouble in, in the EU. But I, in the lab, I wrote a script to run the lab overnight, like, you know, just beat the crap out of these, this cookie API. And what would happen is in the browser would be running like all this JavaScript for, you know, 20, 30 minutes or something like that. But I, would, I was trying like null cookies, you know, empty string cookies, uh, super long cookies, cookies with ASCII, cookies with Unicode, so on and so forth. Um, binary, binary data in the cookie. Um, and I would do that on every build and it would just beat the, beat the heck out of that build every night. Um, the fun thing was in the lab, uh, I actually, in the web browser, I had an, an animated GIF of, um, of, uh, of Cookie Monster eating the cookie. So in the lab, it was all quiet all night except the machine would wake up and, and you know, sound like Cookie Monster. But again, this idea of testing is, and especially using automation for testing, is to try to break the software, right? So, um, so then I worked on Chrome for a little while. And what I loved about that team is that, you know, people think like, oh, I must be a, Jason must be a good tester because Chrome was pretty reliable, at least back in the day. Um, but it had nothing to do with me. It was the fact that the entire team was focused on quality and testing the thing, right? This was a, um, a, comic, an, um, a comic book produced by the, the engineering team and, and PMs to tell the world we're building a new browser. And guess what its core feature is? that we test it. <laughs> that was the main feature. Main feature of Chrome was that it was high quality. So I got a ride on the, the coattails of, of, you know, uh, up to, it grew, the team grew to like, I don't know, the time I was there, Max was like 200 engineers or something. But um, everyone was focused on quality and being the crap out of the software, more importantly than features. In fact, the first few versions of Chrome, for a while, we didn't even have bookmarks. I mean, could you imagine shipping a browser without bookmarks, right? Just basic functionality wasn't even in there, but we want to make sure it was super robust on the areas of performance, stability, and, uh, and security. Hey, Jason, I'm just wondering what year was this? I'm trying to place it in, term, in context in terms of, you know, folks thinking about agile and testing and so on. Actually, a good question. So one is you're trying to date me, uh, but two, this was um, like Chrome's, like single digit versions. Um, boy, it was, let me see, 2000. I'm going to get it wrong. wrong. It's probably 2000, see, seven, 2007, maybe 2008. Okay. Actually, okay. I can't remember. I actually can't remember. I'm old. I'm getting old. Uh -huh. but, but, but to the point of, of agile, this is an extremely interesting thing about Chrome is that you can do, you can do high quality projects with agile. Like this is the most extreme agile project I'd ever worked on. And even ever since, like we, we built in public, like we actually produced the builds that were available to the public before the test team picked them up, right? And it was a continuous CI, CD, 
um, uh, build system. And we even had open source testers working on it, right? And the public could be on the dev channel and pick up the daily builds of the thing. So it was very extremely agile, extremely um, uh, um, real time, and, and and extremely like you know CI/CD fast pace, right? It was it was it was crazy. But we were able to produce a solid product, and we could talk more about that in a minute. But that's uh, it's very interesting that you bring it up. It's related to agile and kind of uh, CI. Mm -hmm. It was really CI and CD and Agile before it really had a name. Right. Um, so, uh, so again, there's another cartoon picture, right? We, I, I managed um, a couple of software engineers. All we did was manage a couple of Python scripts, but we'd run them on 100,000 machines every night, right? Uh, and they would click around inside the browser every new build and look and browse through the internet, right? Because the, the accountability was to make sure the internet rendered correctly in the web browser um, and it doesn't scale with humans but we were trying to build monkeys that would generate load to try to find problems. We were looking for problems, looking for bugs. We weren't making, looking to make sure that the thing still worked. And, and back to the agile thing, the way we actually made sure the browser worked was we had these early staging um, channels, right? It was developed with dev, dev, um, I forget now, dev, canary, oh, it was canary, canary, beta, and, and stable, I think were the ones back then, uh, the channels. So we relied on end users picking up the early builds, making sure it still just worked for them. And they were kind of our canaries in the coal mine. But then to make sure all the corner cases and all the hard problems and all the odd cases uh, were covered, we scaled it with automation and monkeys that really just tried to break the browser all the time. Mm -hmm. so, so that's enough of the history of tour, tour of my life. This is, it's interesting because what I realized was that up until this point, uh, in my, my life and in testing world in general, like if you were a software tester, you spend 80% of your time testing the software and we'll talk about definition testing, but you were trying to break the stuff When you found a crashing bug, you found, um, um, a ship blocking bug, you were awarded, you were celebrated, you were awesome. Right. And we only spend about 20% of our time actually thinking about, does it still work? Right. Most of the time is trying to break the software. Um, so at this point, this is when the world started to shift a little bit. This is why testers aren't testing as much anymore. So I worked at a company called Utest, and what we did then was we had crowdsource testing, and like Uber for testing for software testing, and companies would give us their their the, the rope tests, the tests they don't want to bother with, or the tests that were very specific to devices or location. They'd send us those tests, and we would execute them. But I realized that that looking across all the types of tests that we were executing, these tests were uh, very similar across apps and they were the same stuff. It's like log in, log out, right? It's like search for something. It's um, edit my profile page. It's add something to the shopping cart and then remove it. Just very basic functional testing. But the vast majority of our, of our, you know, our work in business was doing this very basic, very repetitive software verification, right? We weren't really celebrating for finding bugs. In fact, if we found a bug in a product in an area that they didn't ask us to test, customers would be unhappy because it randomized them because they had to actually look at it, evaluate it, and, and think about it. They just wanted to make sure the stuff works like it did yesterday. So then we move into what a lot of these teams were doing, which was this, this world of agile that you might've heard of, Phil. Um, but, uh, and this is my career limiting move here, right? But what happens whenever everyone else tried to pick up agile is they didn't do the testing. Like back in Chrome, we actually did testing you know, alongside of our, of our agile cycles. And frankly, the, to be clear, the, that testing effort, both manual and, um, and, uh, and automated, was not tied in with the ship schedule. It was a separate thread, a separate process in the organization that was trying to beat the software up all the time, right? right. Occasionally pick up the new builds and then beat the crap out of it. Uh, but the mainline team was doing Agile, and they were doing typically what this little diagram is here I stole from some web page. But the funny thing is, is the typical of Agile teams, in this Agile cycle, there's requirements, design, implementation, verification, and maintenance. Where's the testing box, right? It just doesn't exist in Agile. People can pretend they add a little extra a couple of days on the end of the cycle, or, um, but the reality is that almost every Agile team I've worked with and talked with at, at big companies, small companies, they don't actually have a testing, a formal testing effort. Um, and when they, they call it testing, it's usually just verification of basic functionality. So they're testing that the new features they added that week in that sprint work basically well, 
and then they're um, making sure that the core functionality still works, and then they ship it. So what we've seen is this transition in the last, you know, maybe seven, eight years with the advent of Agile, um, uh, where most people with a soft with the title of software tester are are doing most of the work is actually just verification, um, and very little of it is actually testing. So these testers are waking up every day. They have a new build. Everybody's in a scramble for the sprint to focus on the new features, right? But they're not focusing on the technical debt. They're not focusing on edge cases. They're not uh, allocating enough time to build a robust test automation effort. Um, they're just verifying the software every day. And occasionally they test when they feel like it and they're in the mood, try a corner case. But really most of that testing is left up into production uh, with end users today. Hey, Phil, have you shut the feed off yet? Okay, I'm just making sure. Um, so, so this has real world consequences, right? Um, I mean, I've, I've used this example before, but like Uber. So Uber, people may not have heard of Uber. In case you haven't heard of Uber, they have many billions of dollars in the bank and they have thousands of software engineers and some smart test engineers that I know and have met and they still have this. This is just a screenshot from my daily usage of the app, right? And like, I just get an air dialogue. Sorry for the delay. What do you mean you're Uber, right? I need to get home, like your infrastructure, like you're my transportation from the airport back to my house. Um, in this case, you know, I even like killed it, restarted the app, same thing, right? That didn't even fix it. So there I am stuck without Uber. The moral of the story is this is the first time I filled out and created a Lyft account. So this, these issues really impact business. And now about half my rides are on, on Lyft. So they've lost thousands and thousands of dollars uh, because of that bug. So there's another company um, called Google. People have heard of them probably. They have hundreds of billions of dollars. They have tens of thousands of engineers. And in this case, people might have seen this, this book before, where the Google Play Store stops, right? The interesting thing is that Google owns the Play Store code. They own the operating system. They, by and large, own the Pixel hardware. And they still can't get software right. It's still bugging, still breaking, still crashing, and blocking basic usage of, of, of applications, right? So these are the real world consequences of, of teams picking up Agile, in my opinion, picking up Agile and switching to verification as opposed to testing the edge cases. So if you look at, again, so here's two, two more examples, Snapchat and Facebook, right? So this is the consequence of verification versus testing. Snapchat, I can't, talk about a whole lot of deals. Let's just say I've, I've, I know of their team and when given a large set of examples of edge test cases that were causing problems like crashes and, and functionality and UI breaking and stuff like that on core paths, they didn't care. They actually just didn't care. Why? Because they're making money. Their usage is still going up into the right and they're just getting a buy with, with basic verification and they like to think they're agile and shipping all the time. They're modern software, right? But look at this... Uh, uh, look at these ratings, right? Are you proud of the quality at Snapchat today? Uh, if you work there or if you're a user, you get frustrated. You keep coming back because it's like crack, but it doesn't mean that the product is actually good. Uh, Facebook has similar problems too. So not only am I, I going to be able to work in agile teams, I won't be able to work at any of the, the top app companies anymore. I'm genius. Um, but, uh, but these guys, you look at them. Um, where is the... Uh, what I find interesting here, Jason, is that you're kind of implying that Testing or that verification is taking the, um, the positive path, the easy path, the way it should work versus testing, which is going on the edges. Is, is that kind of what you're kind of defining and differentiating between verification and testing? Absolutely. I should just have one slide. You should have made it and then we call it like five minute presentation. Yep. <laughs> okay. <laughs> like, absolutely. That's exactly it. Okay. Um, yep. And if you look at these, and if you look at this, there's evidence here, right? So look at the version history of these applications. If you looked at all of any version history, you probably should as testers of these, these apps that you're using, like it's, they're always talking about bugs and they're bad bugs, stability improvements. Sorry about that crash on launch. Sorry, some people couldn't log in the other day. Um, it's a constant stream of, of bug fixes. And the funny thing is, like, if you look at this, there's not a lot of feature discussion in here. They're shipping a lot. The apps look the same to me. All they seem to be doing is shipping bugs, <laughs> if you really think about it. Uh, they're, they're shipping bugs. Uh, and then a lot of times on the left-hand side, you can't read this stuff probably with the text being that font size. But on the left-hand side, it, people are so tired of seeing, of writing the bug reports up in the app store when they, when they push 
new versions that they just call it, they, they hard code it to bug fixes and improvements, every single build. Like that's the sad state of software quality today. It's actually embarrassing. Um, like literally, yeah, we just assume that we're just always doing bug fixes and improvements because we never really ship a great version of the software, right? Um, and this is a result of, of people focusing on verification um, and not, uh, not testing. And again, testing is, we'll get the definition, but testing is not just the extremes, it's, it's testing it in different configurations, different matrices, different, like uh, perhaps, you know, a lot of these people use these, these apps are only testing on a clean, you know, version on a Nexus, um, you know, a Pixel, uh, and they launch it up on the Pixel, and if there's no other apps installed, there's no other data, um, there hasn't been a previous build installed on that on that uh, on that OS before. It's a clean machine, um, but these these all these corner issues show up when you have crud accumulated from previous versions, other applications. Um, you know, you're in the middle of, of of chatting, and then you get pulled into the phone, and then back into the app, and the app has to re wake up again, um, or the OS crashes on it because it runs out of battery, and then you've got a rehydrate state uh, from a partial serialization of your app state. Um, that's where all the major crashes and bugs and unexpected things happen. And that's what really gets the, gets users upset. So, um, so when did this become okay? I buried the lead, which is, um, agile, like really the advent of agile, I think, and this isn't just anecdotal. I mean, I've talked to a lot of teams, um, and I've done some analysis of app store data comparing how frequently teams ship versus the star ratings and bug report uh, frequencies. Um, and agile seems to be highly correlated with this, this new world order. You know, the theory is that the premise is that we could ship faster so we can fix bugs faster, but it seems to have the exact equal opposite of that in fact, in impact, which is we also just ship more bugs faster. Um, it seems to be like a net net neutral. And I have a nerdier, I can go into that. I have some data that actually kind of shows that based on app store data. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll dig my grave further, which is that, I also believe Agile is just lazy software engineering. Like back in the day when you had to plan with a Gantt chart and you had to think about your waterfall shipping, you had to have a test period where you had to estimate how long you were testing. You had to, to uh, and you had to manufacture like CDs and you had these, you know, 18 month like plans and coordinating with other teams and what you know test and how. Like, Are you trying to cause a riot? Um, okay, here's the crazy thing. Like I, when, I, when I chat about this stuff, Everyone, not everyone, a lot of people come up to me and they're like, you're totally right, but I'm scared to say it. <laughs> um, and, but yeah, yeah, I think that there should be a little bit of a riot. At least people should wake up, right? And know that this is probably, this is at least prove it wrong, right? Um, but yeah, there's a little bit of riots going on. <laughs> okay. And, uh, and by the way, it's not also not me just being, to be clear, I'm not just always, you know, the tester in me those always want to rail against the standard or the, you know, if everybody's doing agile, like there's gotta, it's easy to pick at agile and say, Oh, it's got these problems. Right. But I've literally lived cause I'm an old man now I've lived through, you know, extreme waterfall of operating system releases, right. Um, all the way to, to building mobile apps to um, in my own company, guess what we do. And this is the clear thing. My own company, guess what we are. We're agile. We're quote agile. We don't even have consistent standups to be frank. Um, we're extremely lazy software engineers. I just am the only one person that's willing to admit it. Uh, so in, in the agile world, you just don't have time to test. We talked about that. Also, there's often no testers, like literally on agile teams, and it's becoming a, a thread or hip, a hipster thing to do today to actually not have testers, dedicated testers on the team. Um, so there's literally no opportunity for somebody dedicated to a testing task to even test the application. And more so, you go and I walk into these companies. These companies are worth, you know, on the order of a uh, you know, billion, 10, sometimes a hundred billion dollars. You talk to their teams, guess how they test? Hey, pizza, everybody. Right? <laughs> like they literally know they're proud that they actually are disciplined enough on Friday afternoons to, to, to order pizza, get some beer, and then play with the app a little bit. Like, like they're actually proud to say that's their process because they it shows that they care. This is like, not engineering like i sound like an old fuddy daddy but this is just not engineering and and and, and this isn't this isn't testing um you know like in between bites of a pizza you're coming up with a test case um it just doesn't it just doesn't happen so just basically you're getting verification from your end users today 
uh, and people that are intoxicated with beer and, uh, and getting tired with pizza and waiting to get out of the, the office on Friday. So some more trends, some, some more evidence. How am I, am, I, am I just making this crap up or whatever? So the funny thing is I kind of estimated it's this 80-20 thing, right? We've really gone from 80% testing to 20% testing over the course of my little career. So I did a quick query on the Google search frequencies for the, for the phrase software testing. And you know what? It was really similar. <laughs> it was very close to my experience. Um, so you can see, you know, since 2004, I think I graduated college in 98 or 1998. Um, but you can see this precipitous drop off, right? And it's asymptotically approaching. By the year 2300, um, it will be zero. No one will actually query about software testing anymore. But nobody's even like asking the internet about software testing. Um, it's just an indication of, of curiosity about the space and, and attention paid to software testing. Um, I can talk to this one. This one's a little, this one's a little bit more, just more for fun. It's not provable. It's more just purely anecdotal. But um, if you look at the hot regions, the dark blue regions, this is where people um, as a percentage are more frequently querying for software testing. And the funny thing is, and I actually predict this ahead of time, but I don't have a record. It's Washington State because they build operating systems. It's like New York area because they build financial systems. And it's in the DC, Virginia area because they build medical systems. And those kind of systems will kill people or cost billions of dollars if there's a software failure, right? So they actually do a lot of testing and they seem to be asking the world and the internet a lot about software testing. California is kind of a medium, lukewarm blue. Um, and I made this joke before, but I got in trouble. But basically I think Montana doesn't have the internet yet. Um, so it's not really fair to show that there's little interest in software testing there. But, but if you look at this map, it's, Places where you think that should be thinking about software testing are still thinking about software testing, but most of the rest of the world, and those are kind of legacy apps if you think about it, but the modern app world, the, the modern agile people are more in these kind of middle states and in Texas, Austin and California. They're not talking about software testing as much as these kind of older legacy, uh, more kind of enterprise system uh, software areas. So again, just another indicator that like people aren't thinking enough about software testing. So to get to the definitions, uh, if you look at this, there's, I should just highlight the one string, it's interesting. But, but really testing is about um, the second this bullet under here, which is reveal the strengths or capabilities of someone or something by putting them under strain, right? That's one of the best definitions I've ever had. There's a lot of definitions of testing and software testing. But really you're trying to see if the system holds up under non-normal conditions, right? Um, border, like edge cases, um, stress, mode, um, strange input, strange output, strange contexts. Um, that's actually what testing is. If we look at what verification is, you're basically just verifying that something works the way you expected it to, right? So if you're, I guess a lot of people on this webinar are software testers. So ask yourself, which, what are you really doing all day? Are you doing this stuff? Are you stressing it? Are you straining the system? Are you trying to make it break? Like, you know, Whitaker wrote that book called How to Break Software, right? That was, that's software testing. Most of other stuff we're doing, even automation today is checking, right? Like the automation that was a building in, in school and, and early in my career was generating test data, right? And, and edge cases. Uh, most stuff we're testing today is just verification. It's trying to automate the login sequence with a normal account. It's trying to to add something to the cart and make sure it doesn't crash. Those are checks, those are verifications. They're not actually uh, software testing. So really just take a second and think, which one are you? Are you really a software tester or you are a, a software verification engineer? So most of you, if you're honest with yourself, you realize you're a software verifier. You're not a software tester. Um, you're basically making sure that the build works. Um, you focus primarily on happy paths or just a little bit off of the happy path. Um, and if you think about it, if your team thinks you're an awesome engineer when there's no bugs and the release cycle is fast, you're not a tester. Like, forget even your own view of yourself. If your team gets cranky when you find a bug or if you slow down the process, you're not a tester. You're a verifier. Software testers, when they wake up in the morning, they're actually looking for bugs. They're hunting for bugs. They get paid for bugs. They get paid for stopping the release, right? They get paid 
for finding that obtuse bug that would have been catastrophic for the business that no one would have worried about. Developers never thought about that scenario. Um, but you kind of save the business, right? Or save millions of dollars by finding a particular race condition. That's, that's a software testing. So chatting with some friends about this, um, which I thought was really controversial originally, and then it turns out that it's less controversial because most people kind of agree, but is how do you quantify this? So how do we know as an organization apply to verification versus testing? Um, so came up with this stupid little formula because people like formulas, right? But I call it the verification percent rule. Very creative. But the idea is that verification, the amount of verification that you should do is proportional to complexity, danger, and speed. Or sorry, inversely proportional to complexity, danger, and speed. So if your app is very complex, you should do a lot more testing. If it's very dangerous, like it will kill people, if it fails, you should do a lot more testing. If you need to... If you're shipping very slowly, ironically, I mean, you're only shipping every three months or every year, you need more testing. Um, so it's just a quick way to kind of estimate on a scale of one to 100 where your team should be. And if you plot it, this is a very sophisticated graph of uh, if you do the computation for your own team, and it can tell you where you fit in the range. I should probably have, you know, 20, like, you know, right in the middle, you should have 50% of your testers be verifiers and 50% of your people be testers. Um, if you're a test manager, you should think about this is how you should probably reallocate. This is how you should allocate your money, your headcount, and your your time uh, is is kind of along this, this rough boundary. As a, it's a function of how dangerous your software is, how complex it is, and how often you ship. Hey, Jason, just a quick question: What's the CDS zero and hundred there? What's the horizontal axis? Um, I just I just grabbed a random chart off the internet. Oh, okay. okay. No, I'm, I'm kidding. That's sad you believe that, Phil. Um, <laughs> well, I'm no, just, it, I'm just verifying, you know. I'm not really. <laughs> Sorry, it was, it's this complexity. CDS stands for complexity, oh, danger, and speed. Okay. So it's, the, it's the average of those, those numbers. Okay. So <laughs> I wouldn't put it past me to just grab a random thing off the net. Okay. But yes, yeah, so you can find out where you are in the spectrum, right? And again, at the boundaries, there's probably no project where you should spend less than 20% on testing or less than 20% on verification. They're both needed, they're both necessary. It's just the proportionality is, is interesting. So I'll just really keep it very simple. I think that this thing can actually be written the rise of the software verifier, right? I think we've, this transition happened so slowly over the last decade that no one's really felt it urgently or realized it because the frog's been boiled so slowly. Um, I think what we have is, you know, the vast majority of people with a software tester title are actually software verifiers. And I think uh, we should call them that. I think we should have, the reviews should be based on it. There, there should be different conferences on it because they're very different and, and almost orthogonal roles. One person is just trying to make sure the stuff works as efficiently as possible. The other one's trying to break it as efficiently as possible. But they're very different motivations. Um, and if you claim that you're able to do both, you're probably not the best of either one, right? So I think it's, I propose there's probably, a, and who am I to say this, but I think there should be a bifurcation in the, in the software quality world and say we really have software verifiers and we have software testers and they're very different orthogonal, even career paths. And they have different rewards and different uh, job requirements and different expectations and even different training. Um, so I think this is really the culmination of this is just that there's, there's a new there's a new kind of engineer out there working on thinking about quality and it's the software verifier. So that's it. I can take some, uh, some Q&A I'd love to. Wow. Um, okay. So, you know, one of the questions I've got is, so where does automation and AI fit in terms of verifying versus doing real testing? Is, is verifying an easier thing to do uh, via automation or using AI or is some, you know, where does that fit in? Right. And actually, I'm probably surprised you and probably most people are not mentioning AI at all. Um, I'm actually still a tester in my heart. Uh, okay. and, we, and we can't give everything over the machines quite yet. Right. Uh, so, so it depends. The funny thing is, at the, the very easiest thing to do, ironically, it's, a little, it's hard to come explain without a whiteboard, but the very easiest type of testing is, I mean, sort of, of automation to build is actually of the actual testing type. So think back to the, that thing where I tested the, 
the uh, um, the Reed Solomon encoder for Lockheed Martin, that satellite messaging thing, mm -hmm. it is really easy to write 10 lines of code that generate arbitrary messages with random uh, bit flips, right, with errors uh, to test the system. So in only like four or five lines of code, you can really generate you know, hundreds of thousands of valid testing type test cases. Um, but then if you go a little bit more complex than that, to, to write things that to automation that verifies correct functionality, you have to actually understand the functionality, understand the specification, and then go in and manually craft, you know, this, this uh, test that meets the specification. So it's actually ironically a little harder to build basic checking automation software. That's just a little more difficult. And that's actually what the vast majority, I think it's implied in the question, the vast majority of automation today is just checking, right? It just does the same thing, logs in over and over and over and over again as many times as you run it, right? Well, I mean, there has to be a lot of knowledge behind generating these uh, domain knowledge and generating these checks. You know, it still takes some knowledge to know what to check, right? Oh, absolutely. And that's what I'm trying to argue. What I'm trying to say is it almost takes too much. Like, it's very simple to generate edge case boundary case or just buzz testing right that's pretty easy to write next level up in in automation and uh, complexity is exactly what you said there's a step function where you have to understand the product you have to understand the expectations you have to understand the limitations of the software and then the business goals and then go out and code those things up that's incredibly expensive and i think that's where we've gone frankly wrong a little bit the last five to ten years even longer in test automation is that we focus on that, right? Because we think the business wants to make sure you can still log in, right? But we spend $20,000 worth of engineering time to log in, but guess how many testers you could have paid to, to do that <laughs> every morning on every build, right? Like we, we were automating the easiest thing, ironically, with a very complex solution. Uh, we should be focusing on the easy low-hanging fruit of kind of fuzzing and, and generating a lot of, of, of extreme input. Um, and then we should probably skip most of the checking automation which is like 90% of everything is written today and go to that next level where the machine or the test automation um, leverages like, um, you know, AI machine, uh, machine learning to identify patterns in the software that are good or bad, right? Like imagine if you let loose an AI through um, the top 1000 shopping cart apps, if it's smart enough to walk around in those, right. And understand the common behaviors and then realize, Oh, Amazon's got five stars and it makes a, a dump load of money, that's probably a good shopping cart experience, do you know what I mean? Um, whereas um, other apps at the bottom, like with low ratings, low revenue, probably not the best shopping cart, but it can learn, like can learn an indifference, create the, understand the difference in the flows between all these applications. So that's a little bit of a teaser on AI being able to scale the thousands of apps and understanding which are the good patterns and bad patterns and then telling you what's a good or bad pattern through code. I think that's, where people should be looking next in terms of um, procedural and or AI um, uh, test automation. That's good. I mean, that's talking about more about the design of the shopping cart or the experience of the shopping cart, right? I mean, if... Um, right. But uh, a, a question came in from David. David's, David's asking, do you see test automation more as verification and manual testing more as the tester role? That's... I'm trying to say, I think it's, I think it's the spectrum. I think that on the manual side, I think we need to just call it what it is. There's two types of software. Forget the word QA engineer. That's even worse. That's more polluted. But there's really two people that are that are looking at software, looking for, um, for quality issues. There's a software verifier and a software uh, tester. So on the manual side, I think there's just there's both, and they're predominantly verifiers today. But we should be more systematic about um, what we call ourselves and how we we allocate our resources across those two. And the same thing, it's um, automation is both. Um, I think overly biased toward um, simple verification or checking on the automation side today. And I think that people need to be more of a software engineer, not a software verifier on the, on the automation side. We should be building code that um, on the low end fuzzes the crap out of it, right? Things that a human couldn't have done. Um, and at the high end, um, build systems that find insights at scale that individual humans could not have even figured out, right? Like, is that a good shopping cart design or flow, right? Or if it's played with every shopping cart in the shopping apps, um, you know, our, our app may, may crash, you know, one out of a hundred times, but the average is one in a thousand. So maybe we don't care as much, right? But it's kind of both manual and automation have aspects of 
just making sure it works and also aspects of just making of just trying to break it it's it's both um that if that answer works mm -hmm. just we need to be very disciplined as an engineering field to make sure that those ratios are correct and we're automating the right stuff and i think we're so to be clear i think we're doing it ass backwards on both fronts like we have humans do things that are often better done with machines today and on the automation side, we have automation doing things that humans are better at. Like it's, it's kind of a bizarro land today of, of how we allocate resources and focus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd have to agree with that. I think that um, you said uh, quite a few um, non-PC terms today, Jason. I mean, Montana, not thinking about testing. I just won't go to Montana anymore. Yeah, I don't think you should. The only reason is I think they just had, when I was in, I was in Butte recently, um, and I'm okay not going back for a while. <laughs> okay. One more question from, um, from Matthew. He says, uh, it seems to me that managers are always looking for the silver bullet and verification as opposed to testing seems to what we, we should be looking for. And um, I guess it's a comment just as much as it is a question. Uh, maybe you have a, mm -hmm. uh, some thoughts on that. You know, what, what, what do we do for our managers? Cause we have to make them happy, right? Or, yeah, well, I think that it's all about, especially when you have, if you're man, regardless of whether your manager is, I think we're just, most testers are very passive um, and reactive. So I think the biggest thing I've learned in terms of managing up, you have to proactively manage up, even regardless of whether your manager is an engineer, uh, like engineering manager, test manager, or product manager, you need to manage. And they're, they'll almost always stay out of your business. It's a, a secret. If you have a little system, right? So if you went back to, if you basically said, hey, I've got this system, this Jason Arbon guy had some stupid chart, uh, but I've done the math and we should have 65% of our people and resources spent on verification and the other spent on, on uh, testing. Um, and I've thought through this problem and then what are we gonna focus on? I've done some risk analysis and these are the hot areas, and these are the areas that we don't care about or have low ROI. And I've got a plan and you push that up into the organization, they usually just leave you alone and they trust that you've thought about it better than them. That's the key thing. They just, they just want to know that you've thought deeper about the problem than they have, and they usually leave you alone. So in terms of trust or what a, you know, a silver bullet is or what, um, uh, uh, what you're doing, not only should you be doing the right thing, you just need to have some structure to what you're doing and not just add more test cases every day, right? Just but have some structure and plan around it and push that up, and then people will relax. Because one, testers, non-verifiers don't think about that. They think about features. They think about the business. They think about... UI, uh, generally speaking, they care about um, downloads. So if they don't have to think about quality or testing or verification, they're more than happy to leave you alone. Yeah. So one, one couple more questions. They seem to be rolling in now. So what about, um, what about a boss or a client that says that they want um, maximum automation, like 100%? What do you say to them? Depends on what your career goals are. So guess yeah. what most testers do? They go, yes, sir, thank you, sir, because I want to be a developer because I can make more money. Right. So then they spend all their time just focusing on writing horrible code and practicing and learning on the company's dime. That's the, the most common <laughs> real world way it works. Uh, but no, I think you just have to come back and say, again, this is a matrix. Maybe it needs a system around it, but you look at, you look at your product, do the risk analysis, um, and you figure out how much verification versus testing you need done. And then you figure out of those things that need to get done, what's the most efficient way to do it? Is it going to be through humans um, or automation, right? right? And you look at what resources you have available. Most teams don't even have the option to have a software automation uh, a programmer on the test team, right? Dedicated. So you balance that with the business requirements and resources that you have. And I think then out comes your, your plan. But again, you have a plan. And if your plan is more sophisticated than than your peers or your management would have for testing, then they just kind of leave you alone. Um, but uh, if you want to automate everything, you, you, you can easily push back with a better plan. Like you tell them this is more cost effective and this will actually, you know, reduce risk overall. They won't push back very often because like they're basically, they're basically undermining someone who's thought through it more than they have. And then their accountability for, then they're accountable for quality. Mm -hmm. Basically, they go, hey, yo, like, like, okay, you're right. If, in, if they want to fire you because you don't agree with them, I would say be fired and go work someplace that's more constructive. Um, but if you have to keep your job, you just say, okay, well, I had a plan for quality. You've changed it. 
um, you know, good luck with that. I'll, I'll do my work and keep my nose down to the grindstone. But when stuff hits the, hits the fan, right. um, do what I, I said we should be doing. So yeah. accountability is, is moving up. Well, there's one more question slash comment from Eric. And he says, what about dev testing and integration testing? Um, does that have to be manual? Is there, is for automation, there's not really enough time to automate that. Yeah, so I think this is a, a fallacy, actually. I think that um, the faster you're building and the further left the testing is, uh, meaning is it in the, you know, is it post-build, is it, you know, pre-check-in, or is it even TDD, the extreme end? Um, the further left it is, by, f like, almost exponentially, it's more important to have that automated as much as possible because it will be used and executed more frequently. Um, and so, uh, so there's a bias toward automating things that are further left, and there's a bias toward automating less the further right it is uh, in in the in the in the cycle. So I think that's a that's a good rubric to follow. So you're, so actually, you're saying that we should be automating more towards the left than to the right. Is that what you're saying? And that speaking, yeah. So generally speaking, yes, yeah. So yeah. if um, can imagine like that's why that's what happens today even right if you look at it there's just a lot more unit like on chrome i don't remember how many we had we had like um 20, 000 unit tests we had right. maybe five thousand or something integration tests and then we had you know i don't know 1100 or something manual ui tests um and that's because it's it's you know on every developer's machine those unit tests are run before check-in then mm -hmm. on every build which happens less frequently the integration right. tests are run and then you know, on every, you know, two week cycle or something, the, uh, the integration stuff is run. But, but I'll, I'll add to this, and this is what's a little maybe confusing to people, but I think that's actually completely gonna change. So what business, the business cares about, so that's just basically a return on investment with today's technology. Back to kind of the AI machine learning world, the irony is that with machine learning and AI, it's easier to teach the machine how to do the testing from the right hand side of this graph. So it's easier to teach a machine how to, how to interact with an application than it is to teach a machine to build intelligent unit tests. Because AI today can learn from human examples. So they basically mimic humans. So without a lot of code and energy, you can actually get a lot of automation now on the UI side. So that's what's changing right now uh, uh, in, in the, with this, this AI machine learning kind of uh, transition that we're going through. So that will change. But if you don't know AI and ML, stick to the classic pyramid and stick to the classic, you know, automate stuff the further left it is. Mm -hmm. Easier and it will be used more often. But if you're in the AI and ML world, it's actually going to flip that testing pyramid um, upside down in the next few years because it will be far easier to automate the UI than it is ever automating the, um, um, the unit integration tests. Mm -hmm. and it's more reusable. So because a human can test any app UI, not every human can test the internals of an implementation at an API level or integration level on an app. So that code is going to be reusable, meaning most every app will soon have uh, um, almost free test cases for cart functionality, search functionality, logging in, uh, because it's reusable, because of machine learning. That's, what's, that's the change that's coming up. Right. One more question, and it's kind of related to the, the title of your, the webinar today was, you know, testers don't test anymore. But in the future, and we've talked about automating the left and automating to the right, you know, where should we as testers be moving in terms of our knowledge and our careers and, and things like that? That's a loaded question. You just want me completely ostracized. <laughs> I mean, I, I want to know if I'm going to have a job, right? I mean, I, I got to have a yeah. high growth. It's funny. People, the smarter, smart people, smarter people are, the more likely they're to ask me that question, actually. I think that there's a couple, a couple of things on that that I, that I really believe in. I'm actually seeing, in fact, I was even talking with two other testing companies, the CEOs in the last week, um, and they're seeing the same thing. It's not just me being a nutcase on, on, the, on the boundary, right? Um, what's happening is testers need to, you know, they say move left or move right. I think what you need to do is just kind of move up in terms of, um, uh, like the only real testing jobs are going to be left. The interesting ones that are paid well are going to be of two flavors. One is the person that can be all of a extreme tester, like just building manual extreme tests, do risk analysis, 
um, understand the business and understand the customer. So you almost have to be like a, a, a tech lead, like a test lead kind of mentality, but realizing that you do not have access to five other people to do your, your crap work. You either need to do it um, or figure out other ways through data and analytics to do that job. Um, and then the other profession that's going to come up here is um, uh, that you basically can convert to being without programming, by the way, this is an interesting thing. People think you have to go be a programmer to go do a machine learning and data AI stuff. You can actually skip and go straight to the data, you know, machine learning kind of job without skipping and skipping over much of the, uh, the, the programming skills. So I think the smartest testers that are thinking career wise and, and money wise and uh, fun in the job kind of wise and contribution to planet wise will actually make the leap to, um, to being like a data engineer slash machine learning engineer with a focus on testing. So how do you build systems that integrate, um, you know, production information with pre-production, identify quality issues at scale and with analytics, and then make predictions on quality um, based on data, and also literally learn how to, without programming, but play with the modern, um, uh, you know, ML tool. So like, this is a long answer, but if you, if for, for people that really want to geek out, I think the future of this stuff is actually, if you look at uh, um, Google launched a new API or new service called I think it's Visual, I think it's Visual Auto ML. So it's like for auto machine learning for visual stuff. All you have to do is pass it a file, literally like a flat file, like a text file that has a path to an image and then a label on it. And you give it a long list of those things, right? So it could be like, these are examples of bugs in my product or feature, bugs versus features. Or um, this could be, um, you know, like, like not usable, usable, trustworthy, not trustworthy. Whatever you want to like, whatever kind of quality metric you want to have things labeled by, you give it a bunch of examples and you just upload that to the cloud. And then Google will do all the machine learning expertise for you automatically. And we'll go through all these little feature vectors. It'll do train, it'll train nets to train nets for you. And what you come out with is a classifier. So you can give it a new screen or a new sample of your product or a new you know, um, visualization of your log files or something. And it will just tell you if it's a bug or not a bug or if it's if there's got an issue or not or if it's a login button or not or so on and so forth. So thinking in terms of transitioning from test engineering, going straight into kind of uh, data machine learning um, is probably the other path. Okay. It's probably the smarter path. Yeah, if I could just augment that, I think that, um, you know, moving to the left and to the right and staying, getting away from the middle is where to go. Um, in, ter in terms of moving to the right, really, you mentioned this just a minute ago, in terms of really deeply understanding the application and the domain of the application. So if you're testing accounting software, if you're, you know, an accountant, but also a software tester at the same time, you're going to be invaluable in terms of really digging deep and, and testing that software and giving input to the automated testers because they're, they're just, they're just automators, I say, right? Right, and, right. And then on the left-hand side, shifting left, you know, in terms of, um, you know, the, the development type unit testing as well as the integration testing, you know, that's good to automate, but sometimes that can be difficult to automate. So I think that moving in that direction and, and being more technical and being able to understand, um, all the things that need to be automated is really a way to go as, as well. And, and so it's kind of like just um, getting all, over on the fringes where you become more valuable is, is where I think. Um, uh, exactly. Perfectly said. I don't know why you invite me to, to talk about anything at all. Like, <laughs> that's the best answer. You, you said it perfectly. Right. I, was, I was actually conflicted. Like, because you really shouldn't move left. And you shouldn't move right versus the other. It's, it's, yeah, you move to the extreme. And the beautiful thing is you're far more valuable the more specialized you are. Right. 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 And yeah. Exactly. Well said. So I you, shouldn't, I shouldn't even summarize what you said because it's not as well as good. <laughs> if you could go to the last slide, I'll just summarize here and talk a little bit about. Um, yeah. So the the webinar was uh, recorded, as I said in the beginning. So um, thanks very much for joining us today, Jason. It was really great to to have you as our webinar speaker, and we're going to be offering a special Arbin webinar discount. Uh, for those that um, sign up for um, to register for the conference and you can get the early bird discount for attending the webinar today. And uh, also, you know, we really look forward to having you as a speaker this year at the conference, Jason. So thanks very much. And we'll see you in October.
Cool. Thanks, Phil. And I'll actually talk about AI then. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> All right. Thanks very much, everyone. Thanks, guys. See okay. you later. Bye.